Uh, let's kick things off. So um, I'm not sure how familiar all of you are with OKRs, but uh, basically they are objectives and key results. So they're a goal setting tool um, used by teams to set very audacious goals. So uh, Google, Spotify, Twitter, LinkedIn, Airbnb and Blackbird actually um, use OKRs. Um, so we just couldn't think of a better person to run us through the magic uh, of what OKRs can be um, than Ryan Pendrostrom. Uh, Ryan is a co-founder of What Matters, an organization that literally wrote the book on OKRs. It's a good book. If you haven't read it, I'll share it around after. Um, he's also an advisor to the chairman of a venture firm, Pliner Perkins. And before that, he uh, worked as a US Deputy Chief Technology Officer at the White House. So uh, in very wow. good hands today. Um, thought we could just go around and do our usual hi. Um, and then uh, maybe just share what you're sort of hoping to take away from the session. Uh, and then we'll hand it straight over to Ryan. Thanks so much. Awesome. I'm off mute, so I'll go first. G'day, Ryan. My name's Chris. I'm the CFO at Lexa. We're new to the Blackbird portfolio, but um, and actually new adopters of OKR. Myself and Dave spent a bit of time on it um, oh, only a month ago, and um, I think it's going to be awesome. So we're, we're sort of new, and I'm sure there's going to be all sorts of learnings we'll get out of this session. So thank you very much. Um, Dave, um, you're next. Yeah, sure. So I'm Dave. I work with Chris. I'm the CEO at Alexa. Um, we're a Series B company to give you some kind of context of scale. Um, and with regards to the OKRs, the one we've really struggled on is the thematic on product. So we're pretty clear on revenue and the operations part of the business, but product is one that we've really struggled with. So yeah, my name's Lauren. I'm the CEO of Multitudes. We're a tool for engineering leaders that care about culture. Uh, so essentially analytics and recommendations to improve team culture and performance. Um, and yeah, we're a young company. So we raised our seed round at the end of last year. Um, and yeah, so yeah, so exciting things happening. Um, we, uh, we have some good cadences we've set up. So we have like a quarterly planning session for the next quarter. So we've, that's in place, it's happening, but I think we could be using that more effectively. And so I'm really excited to, to have this conversation today. It's uh, great to meet you. Uh, my name's Nathan, um, the COO at Partly. Um, we're sort of pioneering a, a shift in, a, in quite a traditional industry auto parts to be fully connected globally through sort of a data network. Um, and we are sort of reasonably young company as well. We just did our seed round last, uh, halfway through last year. Um, and we've just started using OKRs this quarter or, or season as, as we like to call it. So sort of in the midst of, of really getting, a, getting the hang of it. Um, yeah, it's going reasonably well, but I'm really keen to, keen to hear your thoughts. Yeah. I'm running entry level, which is a very, very early stage startup. We did our pre-seed round in November. And uh, yeah, we've just been experimenting, to be honest. One of our experiments did really well. We have 1,500 students going through a um, sort of program right now, a virtual work experience program as of yesterday. Um, so it's just been a really hectic week. But I think now is the time for us to bring in a bit more structure and a bit more um, sophistication into our team. Because right now we're just running all the time and don't know where we're going half the time. So, um, yeah, I <laughs> appreciate it. Maybe I'll build on the point that AJ said, which was around uh, the sophistication piece. I would say that OKR is actually, rather than sophistication, I think it really helps teams with clarity. And I think when it comes to being great leaders, giving clarity is perhaps, uh, you know, clear direction is perhaps one of the most powerful things. And so we've got uh, almost an hour together. And I think the plan is to quickly run through some slides. And the slides are going to capture some of the learnings that we've made over the past few years of working with OKRs and startups in particular, because startups are a very special kind of organization, which are really, you know, in both cases, growing as fast as they can, but also really fragile as well, too, right? They're very delicate things, like it's building the plane while it's flying. And so let me click share here and see if this works. Cool. You can see my slides? Yes. Awesome. Uh, the tool here of OKRs are, are really simple. And, and that's the kind of fascinating piece about it, right? It's this O in KR. And the O of it stands for objectives. And it's the what you're trying to accomplish and really challenging you and the team to articulate that, right? And, you know, you really want it to be something memorable. You want it to be something that is significant, concrete, action-oriented, 
And if you can, really that inspirational piece, right? Because this is the guiding direction for the team for the year ahead or for the month ahead. Um, and what ends up coming out along with the O is the KRs, right? About how you're going to accomplish it. And both of these, by the way, crafting the objective and key results is an art because there's no perfect way to do it, right? Because it's you as a team setting them. And so the best OKR is the one that really guides your team in the right direction. And for a great set of key results, there are some heuristics to it that really work well, right? Ensuring they're really specific and time bound. You really want to push the team, but you also want to be realistic too. Setting a bunch of KRs that no one can achieve doesn't make this a helpful tool. Um, most of all, you want it to be measurable, and verifiable, right? You can look back at that measure at the end of the quarter and say, did we achieve it or did we not? We have the measurement systems in place to be able to do that. And so OKRs can look like a lot of different things. I share these as some examples. The first one is from the book. The second one is from my actual first experience of working with OKRs. And the third one is from the book as well too, but I'll kind of maybe pick on the middle one. So for me, I was first exposed to OKRs not in the private sector, not at a startup, not at a Google, but actually within government. And I was part of this turnaround team that was fixing a really broken website. And so for uh, folks that aren't familiar with healthcare.gov, it was this really, really, really expensive, really, really big broken project that launched on a day that promised to give a lot of folks access to health coverage and it just didn't work. And so for us as this group that was helping fix it, a way to communicate what we really needed to get done in the month ahead was to articulate it this way, right? We had this objective of let's fix the website for the vast majority of people as measured by seven out of 10 people being able to apply, a thousand uh, millisecond response time, a percent error rate, and 99% uptime. On the surface, this looks really kind of just, you know, very numbers oriented, but, you know, at the time, uh, only six out of 100,000 people could actually apply, right? So the seven out of 10 rate was really far to reach. This millis sorry, this one second response time, you know, when we put New Relic in, it was 12 seconds average. So this was a huge uh, uh, fix. It was like a 10% error rate. And then the uptime, dare I say it, was at 48%, which means you're a half, you're down for half the day. So are you really up or down. But what you can see is this goal fits so easily on like an index card, right? Like, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to prioritize? This is the kind of guiding, guiding light. Um, I wanted to can give I you a- ask, right, yeah, on that yeah. one. I'm just curious, what was the time scale for it? Because you gave us the starting points and then the end goal. So how much time did you give yourselves for that? Yeah. So for us, it, it was, could we turn this around? So this is middle October. Could we fix the, could we get these goals by the end of November? So we gave ourselves a month time frame, and we got really close. We got the seven out of 10. I don't think the response rate was there yet. And the error rate was still in the three to 4%, but, yeah. and then uptime was like 97, but that was stabilizing the site. And then for us, we continued to actually work on it in December, January, February, March, April. And we just changed these goals each month to like make them not necessarily harder, but really to set the bar where it should be. And so um, that's what happened then. Thanks. And so some learnings to share with the group, because there's a lot that you can find online. We have this, you know, long getting, this, sorry, not long, it's like a short, a really short getting started series that takes you through it. But here are a few things that I would love to leave with you and the team. And one of them is uh, you use your OKRs to lead and you manage with other tools like KPIs and JIRA and everything else. A really well-crafted OKR is pointing your team in the direction where you want to go and leaving optionality there, right? You don't really want it to be a task list of items that have to get done, nor do you want it to be this laundry list of what everyone has to do, because there's no way your OKRs are ever going to be able to do that. So if you focus it on the directionality, you know, really helping answer the question of what are we trying to change in the month ahead, the quarter ahead, what do we want to see our company be like a year ahead? That's what the OKRs are for. KPIs come along and you need them because guess what? To manage your company, you need to be looking at a lot of things. So this isn't to say those processes are not worth doing. It's to say that you use them for two very different things. OKR is to lead, KPI is to manage. And my favorite two stories are really around the Allbirds company where Joey and the team there have OKRs, which they call Kiwis, keep improving with intent. They've like renamed them themselves. The uh, TED folks have done the same. They've called OKRs. OMGs, uh, Objectives and Measurable Goals. 
Um, but at, at Allbirds, they also, when you present at your meetings, you start off with the OKRs, but you also have this list called the breathe list, right? All the things we need to do to survive and work, you know, uh, to keep ensure Allbirds continues to thrive. And so you have these two lists that they work from, their OKRs and this other one, they, they, their KPI. So the other piece is to really define success up front. Because one of the kind of surprises with OKRs that comes with it is you set a bunch of them up front at, and goals, and then a month goes by, and then a, or a quarter goes by, and you start to say, well, no, no, that was an aspirational goal, or no, no, we we weren't actually supposed to reach this. And so, what we try to really encourage is like upfront, make sure you call the OKR what it is. Is it a committed goal, where the finish line is truly we have to cross it? right? The definition of success. And um, you could pick on things like uptime as being that, or you could even have a sales goal that's that, or you could just really so the team understands this is committed. And what we see some teams do is next to the KR, they'll put a little C next to it to say this, we're supposed to get 100%. Aspirational, the ones where you are actually pushing the team and really stretching for what's possible. And like what you read a lot about aspirational OKRs is that they usually say it's supposed to be 70%, right? But what, uh, like 70% is success. But what that means is don't set the target at 70%. What it means is if you set a lot of OKRs over time, 70% of the time you're going to have achieved them, right? So sometimes you'll knock them out of the park. Sometimes you'll fall really short. But in average, 60 to 70% is the success rate for those. But those are really pushing and guiding the team. The third OKR type is a new one. It's not in the book because the book really focuses on committed and aspirational. The third one came about by spending more time with startups and companies that are just getting started or groups that are doing R&D where you don't quite know which direction you want to go, but you're really trying to prove something, right? For example, you know, you could set a committed or aspirational goal to ship certain amounts of things or grow certain amount of customers or something like that. But maybe you're just trying to discover if your tool is useful for the small, medium business market, right? Like a hypothesis. So our objective is to discover if this is right. And then you can set a set of key results that prove if this thing is working or not, right? It's almost like a product market fit test versus telling the team to go run off in a direction before you're ready. And this learning OKR really helps teams experiment more. It allows you to fail in a way that lets you learn from it, right? Let's say you don't succeed on this uh, learning OKR. What it means is, well, you gotta adapt or let's say you actually succeed on it. It means then you could probably create a committed or aspirational OKR next. And so that's something to think about as a, as a team. Um, I really like the learning OKRs because you kind of answered my question before I even got to it, which was like, how do you implement OKRs if you're pre-product market fit where you're like, don't even know what you're doing half the time. You're just sort of experimenting and thinking about things. And uh, so I really like that. Um, I was just curious if you could give us, give you more of a tangible example of what a learning OKR could be because I'm struggling yeah. to sort of like visualize it. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm just going to make up one on the fly. Like, let's say we're building a product to help uh, here right now, like vaccination sites, right? In, in the United States for getting this, COVID vaccine out. Um, uh, well, let, let's first to check, like, could we set an objective of building a product that's useful for these sites, right? Like rather than quickly deploying a bunch, getting it out there, like what could we do in the next two weeks that proves this product is actually useful? And maybe a set of key results on the input side is, well, let's talk to 20 different uh, pharmacies and, and, and providers that are actually doing it. Great, that's an input. Some outputs from it could be, um, maybe like being able to collect, uh, from like them, the pain points of it. Like we actually have structured learnings from it or a survey from it, getting a sense that they've actually filled it out. And it's like these certain scores and targets are met. And then maybe like an outcome from it. It might be hard to get an outcome here if it's just like we're learning about things, but you might have an outcome measure there if you've actually built the thing. Right. So it's like you get five people to adopt it. You uh, are seeing a completion rate of like 80% of people who are you like, there's all these ways of framing it. But I think the charge is what are we trying to learn in the next 30 days or 90, the right side? What are you trying to learn? What has to hold true for us to come back 30 days from now and be so excited about the direction we just went on? 
Um, I like to always remind this one, you are, you and your team are the greatest judges of what an OKR should be and could be. And I think what's really important too is that, you know, you all are the CEOs and leadership teams of your companies. And for some of you, it's, you know, you can count the number of people on your team on my hands. And for some of you, you need spreadsheets to figure out who and what are in different departments. But just make sure that like this process of creation truly is a joint activity. So at the end of the planning session, you go, yes, these are our OKRs and that we feel really strongly about them. Because one pattern that doesn't work so well is um, actually forcing your team to use OKRs and you being the ones that are setting all the goals. Because then you're... Um, I think the term in the U.S. is you're micromanaging, which I think extends across all, all borders. Um, and uh, oh, yes, that's right. This, uh, this slide here is actually really to call out the types of KRs that you can create. And um, if you read a lot of the OKR literature online, if you want to call it that, there's really this push to really focusing on outcomes. But on our team at What Matters, we really feel like a great OKR actually has a few elements of these. And it's really up to you to decide what combination makes most sense. For example, inputs, those are the things you control, right? Um, if you take the Bezos way of managing, you know, in his belief, because those are the things you control, those are the things you should be setting your goals on, not the outputs of a process. Um, outputs are the things that are uh, resulting from the work you're doing. If you take the Andy Grove philosophy of, of, of OKRs, he really likes outputs because that's what you can manage a team towards. But I think for us here, it's really about the why everyone's here, right? Why are we doing the work? It isn't just the knocks on the doors. It's actually to get people to vote or it isn't the number of purchases, right? The outputs or the revenue. It's really the customer satisfaction. And that's where outcomes come in, right? You can really measure those. It's really easy to measure inputs. It's a little bit harder to measure outputs. And sometimes it's really hard to measure out measure outcomes, but it's up to you to pick the right set of them to craft a really good OKR. I'd love to um, hear your experience and advice specifically around product. Um, yes. I kind of mentioned that in the setup um, in the intro earlier. Um, we find that the, you know, and I love the, like the tiering or the segmentation of inputs, outputs, outcomes, committed aspirational learning, which provides some a framework to help. But where have, again, kind of experience and advice here, where have you seen product, a product kind of OKRs or we love OMGs, Brewer and I have been chatting while you've been talking, it's more yeah. our culture. Um, how, yeah, where have you seen them work really well? Because at the moment, yeah. you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of things, there's, there, there's, you know, platform uptime and net promoter score and, you know, actually shipping what you said you were going to ship, but actually what is that thing that you said you're going to ship? Like there's so much spread in what that could be. Is it a launch event? You know, so the other thing we've, we have moved to, we operate following a whole lot of principles of the cadence. Um, so we have a kind of Feb 1 kickoff, you know, and the actual sales kickoff, product kickoff, and we've moved to that kind of operating model. But where yeah like where have you seen it work the best because that yeah. is the one that we're really like we're really struggling with it's tough but we've done it tough anyway actually just a little bit more set up there ryan as well sorry the um the other thing i find is um if you put this back in the hand of the product team to set their own okrs they're achievable and bloody um a bit wishy-washy you know, yeah. it's like yeah. Dave and I. We, That's a technical <laughs> term. Uh, wishy washy. <laughs> wishy washy. But think of um, like the point system of managing output for no one understands what the hell it is except for the product team. And they seem to always hit their targets. And it's like, yeah, but did we actually do what? You know, so it's, it's connecting, yeah. I suppose, what the business thinks the product team should be doing to what the product team, how they want to manage their own business, which is wishy-washy. <laughs> yeah. There's uh, the two parts. There's like the product delivery part, Dave, I'm hearing, and then the wishy-washy part. Um, the, the, on the product delivery side, it sounds like there's two pieces to unpack, right? This product team has uh, certain, I think, you, I think you have to be able to articulate what you want all of the work that this team is doing to amount to, right? And so that's kind of the outputs and outcomes side of the equation, right? It's that these sets of sprints of work that we're doing are going to improve 
uh, customer retention rate, feature use rate, um, satisfaction, less support emails, more sharing. Like, you know what you're trying to drive the team towards. And thankfully, because this is a cadence that changes every quarter or so, you'll find out really quickly, oh, wait, do we set the wrong outcome or output that we're pushing the teams toward or inputs, if you want to even say it that way, and we need to adjust them. And so you'll adjust them on the fly. But really, unquestionably, you should be able to describe what you want out of your product in a way that requires no one to articulate what I ship, when I ship, how I ship. (laughs) And so you're really clear about what success looks like for the product you're building. Well, I think, I mean, ultimately what success looks like is uh, increased revenue growth trajectory. And that revenue is the ultimate lagging indicator, like net revenue growth is the ultimate lagging indicator for how successful we've been in converting cash into code, right? And code that our customer wants to buy and gets value from and grows. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the the separation part should work, I think. So you should include... uh, revenue goals and monetary like i think as leaders of teams whether if we you know here this is a for-profit context but i think if we were even talking to a non-profit context and even in governments i think it's really important to share with teams what sustainability uh like how sustainability is achieved for our teams right like we are here to for a non-profit we continue to be able to do great non-profit work if we fundraise if we get donations i mean and we're in the for-profit context here so It's like, we really need to improve our retention. People need to stay. And it isn't just a number target for, because we're, you know, building companies. It's a number target because that's what fuels the business, right? And so creating this connection with your teams about why the money matters, but also to say, well, it isn't just about the money, right? It's the money, like, thankfully the products you're working on are changing the way that people work and are making them happy or satisfied in their work. And so it's like, do you have indicators of other things you can measure that are lead to that revenue piece, right? I think you know why people renew or don't renew. You know why people stay or leave. Those are the measures you have to include as well because the dollar target doesn't feel like I can touch, like I, I, I'm glad you have it there, but um, like, but oh, it's um, uh, like, let's say your product, you realize that people stop using it and they, uh, when a certain number of users in an organization drop below a certain number or a person starts using, like those are the, the metrics and measures that you can actually point your product team towards and say, hey, how do we address that? Because mm-hmm. then it leads to the, hopefully the conversation of, well, but why are they leaving us? Oh yeah, it's because some functionality, like there's no this, there's, there's like, it lets you do that cycle. I think the other piece I wanted to tag on Dave though too is, I get the sense of the point system that there's like a delivery piece that like that you and the team want to keep working on as well. And and dare I say, like you probably could create an OKR focus clearly on delivery and um, really good engineering product culture, right? Separate it from the product for a second so you can be really focused. And if it's not about points, what, what, what ingredients add up to great output from your engineering teams? You know, it isn't lines of code, isn't number of points, but there's certain, there's something else that I think you probably see as deep defects, right? Of like the process. And so separate them. Cause then you can make that objective around us being an incredible engineering organization. And what does it mean to be incredible? It means, boop, 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 right. Um, it means hitting our deadlines. How often do we set a deadline and miss it? How, so I know it's um, the the hard part is OKRs don't fix everything magically, but they certainly. But, I thought yeah. that's why we're here. <laughs> how how do you how deep do you think? You know, what's your experience on 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 how deep to go into these? Like um, you know, yeah. for for us, we've got at the moment we've we've basically got our our company level, and then that's split into teams, so it kind of goes down and then down another level. Um, sort of taking each one of those key results and then kind of splitting it out again um, into something a little bit more detailed. I mean, you could go down even further down to individual people, um, but it kind of almost at that point feels to me a bit hard to manage or, you know. Um, so and firstly, what are your thoughts on how many layers to go down? Yeah. Um, and secondly, I mean, how many, how many key results per objective do you like 
Yeah, it's a great, great set of questions here. When, when a company is just starting, sometimes a whole team is just one person, right? So, you know, a team could have their OKRs and then that individual does not make sense to have their own OKRs, right? Because it's like uh, maybe super meta in some ways. But, um, you know, in the beginning, it's really important to try to craft your like all of these on just a single page, right? And as soon as you start to feel like you need that extra layer because it's not, you're not capturing the most important things at this top level, that really is then the trigger to say, okay, let's start to do another layer. And then let's start to do another layer. Um, you know, one of the things that folks forget is that for Google, uh, who they do OKRs from CEO all the way down to individual contributor, they've been doing them since they were with like just 20 people around a ping pong table, right? That's when John went and spent time with Larry and Sergey and Susan and everyone and, and really uh, shared them this philosophy. And so it, like for you, everyone here, you started early, it's a piece that will then fit into your culture, right? Which is like, then you can start to really get individual OKRs ready when you've got, you know, a hundred people and so forth. And so, um, Nathan, my, but the, the, the piece here was if it feels overwhelming, it likely is. Um, if it feels like a person has their name next to more than three to five key results, like then you're kind of in a point where it's like, well, now this just seems like a lot, right? I'm sort of wondering how, how you handle a situation where you've, you've set your objective um, and you're halfway through your, 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 your season or quarter or whatever it is, um, and then for whatever reason, you have decided that that is, you've changed focus, right? And, and you no longer consider that to be an objective for, for this period of time. Um, how do you handle that? Um, do you change the objective? Like, it kind of feels like, you know, backsliding on something you've committed to. Do you just, you know, do you change that exit? Do you create a new one? Um, yeah. yeah. How, what are your thoughts on that? Um, in that case, Nathan, what you want to do is you actually want to, change your OKRs, right? I mean, if you are in the team going towards a direction where you've learned very quickly, this isn't looking right, does it mean you're changing your KRs? Does it mean reframing the whole objective and key result? Like that discussion is the important one to have with your team, recraft the parts that need to be recrafted and then committing to that, right? And so don't let the box of the OKR process constrict you or force you in the wrong direction. If you realize, hey, this isn't working, right? Like that's actually part of why OKRs are really like really important. It's like you've set a goal and a target. And if you realize as you're working towards it's the wrong one, you should change it. Just to add to that, I think um, our company, meant we've started this first cycle back in January um, and really learning as we go. We've got a coach coming to help us out with some of these questions that you've identified, which I'd recommend to everyone here that wants to, to get to grips with it. Um, but I guess we're coming up to the end of the first cycle, the end of this month, and just wanted to I ask you about what you see as the common traps for young players mm -hmm. like us. They meet at the end of this first cycle, and B, just while I'm from Dave was talking about this whole idea of a retro on on how you did and what learners to take from that to the next cycle. Um, any other sort of yeah. key top line points on that? I think uh, for for teams just starting, it's actually ensuring the next cycle gets started. Right. And doing that well, usually the best thing you can do on day one of starting OKRs is actually sending out all the calendar invites you want to for the year ahead. Just like check in, you know, reshare just so you have it laid out, because, you know, Ali, at the end of the month, when you're going to check in, it's like if it's already there, you'll have time set aside for it. So making sure you do that. The, the other piece is actually doing a really good reflection session. Right. Like, you know, we, we exceeded this OKR. Fantastic. Why? How? How do we get more of it? Really using it as a tool for uh, rallying the team. 